Hi, Fresh Ed listeners. This is Noah Sobe. I'm the president-elect of the Comparative and International Education Society. I've been busy planning next year's conference, which will take place in Atlanta from March 5th to the 9th, with a theme of Problematizing Inequality, the Promise of Comparative and International Education. I want to invite you to join over 3,000 other researchers, students, practitioners, and policymakers from over 100 countries. The proposal submission deadline is quickly approaching. CIS will have just one deadline this year, October 1st, three weeks away. This is a firm deadline, so don't be late if you're planning on presenting at the conference. You can find all the details about the conference and how to submit a proposal by going to the website, CIES2017.org. Again, that's CIES2017.org. I hope to see many of you in Atlanta in March. This is Fresh Ed, a weekly podcast that makes complex ideas in educational research easily understood. I'm your host, Will Brent. How can we think about inequality and education? My guest today, Mario Novelli, dives into that subject by looking at the role of schools in the production of inequality. Mario Novelli is Professor of Political Economy of Education and Director of the Center for International Education at the University of Sussex. Since 2010, Mario has researched issues related to the role of education in peace-building processes, working with UNICEF on a series of projects. In our conversation today, Mario not only details how modernity, capitalism, and colonialism combine to create systems of inequality inside schools, but also publicly struggles with his role in the production of inequality through his work in international educational development. Mario Novelli, welcome to Fresh Ed. Thanks very much for having me. The British Journal of the Sociology of Education has put out a special issue on the work of the French economist uh, Thomas Piketty, who wrote a pretty famous book in 2013 called Capitalism in the 21st Century. And you have a piece in this special issue. What is Piketty's main argument uh, in capitalism in the 21st century, and why does it, it warrant a whole issue of an education journal? Okay, well, um, Piketty's book is a big one, uh, and it really focuses around the rise of inequality over the last 200, 220 years. Um, and his central argument is that Unlike uh, orthodox economic belief that as capitalism has developed and as nations develop, inequality reduces. Uh, In fact, what he highlights is that apart from a brief interlude between the First and Second World War, inequality has tended to increase. And what that leads him to develop is a kind of um, the assertion of an economic law, which is that... um, Private wealth, inherited wealth, uh, increases faster than uh, productive investment or economic growth. Um, And that has a tendency to increase inequality in the long run. Um, And I think that uh, for education, there are lots of implications. There are lots of implications around the role of education in the reproduction of inequality, the role of... of education in potentially redressing inequality and being, in a sense, uh, an equalising factor in society. So there are many dimensions that we thought in the special issue we might be able to explore. And uh, as you know, my particular work focuses on the relationship between education and conflict. So I went a bit more deeply into that area. And and we will we'll touch on that uh, in a second. Uh, but first... Just generally speaking, in your opinion, does um, Piketty have any weaknesses in his argument that you were able to uncover during your research? I mean, I think there are a lot of weaknesses. I, I, I would like to say that I think it's a great book. I think it's a really important book. And I think that in an accessible way, despite the length of the book, um, he puts on the table some really important ideas around uh, issues of inequality, which for many years has not been a problem. For orthodox economists, inequality is seemed to be something that should be embraced um, as a natural part of 
economic development. Um, in terms of challenges, I think the first one is that Piketty is an economist and although he's much more open than neoclassical economists, his focus is firmly on the economic domain and economic inequality, which for me is important but insufficient. I think if we look at the history of popular movements who have struggled against the inequality over the last 70 years, economic inequality is only one domain of confrontation. It's a key domain, but nevertheless, it's just one site of contestation. I think what we need to explore are other modes of inequality alongside economic inequality, cultural, political, national, and their effects on genders, identities, political rights, human rights, etc. So I think the big, you know, that's a big area is the kind of narrow economism within which we approach inequality. So I think there are lots of more de different dimensions to focus on. The second thing, and I think this is linked to his empiricism, the focus on numbers, on evidence that is attainable, is that I don't think that everything that is important can necessarily be measured, and not everything that's measured is necessarily important. And I think that's why theory matters, because theory sometimes helps us to get under the surface of things that we can't see. Unequal structures, social classes, racism, things like that, that, that exist but are not necessarily visible in you know, the classic uh, countable ways of uh, empiricism. And I think then the third difficulty in Piketty's work, or the third uh, omission, at least for me particularly, is his failure to explore the issue of imperialism. The role of the North in the South, slavery, the history of colonialism, in the history of capitalist development. It's as if capitalist development unfolds through economic laws. But actually what we know is that capitalism has also unfolded through conquest, colonialism, etc. It sounds like he misses some of the... Um I guess more complex issues of of inequality as as a social and and cultural phenomenon, but how does Piketty or does Piketty bring up the issue of education in in his work? Um, well, I guess as an economist, it's not surprising that um, Piketty sees education as a kind of en engine of growth. And potentially, I think, an engine of uh, equity and the reduction of inequality. Um, and, you know, that's linked to his understanding of human capital and the idea that we invest uh, in education in order to improve both our own personal economic uh, wealth, but also the wealth of the nation. Um, though, of course... This is challenged, the, the, the relevance of human capital theory is challenged by himself in the book because essentially what he's arguing is that um, inherited capital, dead capital, uh, is more productive than uh, economic growth and productive capital. So investing in education may not bring you the returns that it might once have brought. So even for the for the human capital theories, there is a problem at the moment in terms of the nature of capitalist development. So that's really where his focus is uh, on um, the returns of education in terms of economic development and economic growth. In your opinion, what is the relationship between education and capitalism if it's not human capital? Okay, well, I think human capital is part of the story. Let's be clear about that. Is I'm not saying that human capital is not uh, important. But I think that if we look at the relationship between education and capital, capitalism, it's much more complex. Uh, I guess 
I would start with Roger, Roger Dale's work of the 1970s, Education and the Capitalist State, where you need to think about education's relationship to accumulation, i.e. human capital, social cohesion, the role of education systems in making different population groups get on or not, and also in legitimation, the role of education in making students accept the situation that they're in, the state of affairs that exists in a society. So in a sense, it has a legitimating effect. It has a social cohesion effect and it also has an accumulation effect. And as Roger always pointed out, these three um, uh, uh, dimensions are not necessarily compatible. So if you focus on accumulation, you may undermine social cohesion through selectivity, etc. Um, and uh, you may undermine uh, accumulation and social cohesion by focusing too much on legitimation. So there are a range of contradictions in that. So that's the first area that I think is important to return to. Um, I think the second area, which is a more modern phenomena, is that education is not just human capital in the terms of self-investment and uh, the production or the role of education in, in, in economic growth. Education has emerged as an important commodity in the late 20th century, early 21st century, uh, whereby um, it's one of the fastest growing industries. And we can see that the expansion of universities and international chains of schools. So education itself is a factor in economic uh, exchange now. And I think that needs to be uh, explored in much more detail and is, is completely avoided in, in, in Piketty's work. As Susan Robertson's article in the same special issue uh, focuses on. Um, the third area, and I think this is again uh, really important, is uh, um, the area of uh, inequalities, the role of education in reproducing inequalities. And I'm not just thinking about class and gender, which is a lot of the focus, but also about the way education systems reproduce north-south inequality. You know, uh, How is it that... Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, remains marginalised in terms of the international economy. And I would say that the role of education, education actors, the international architecture of education delivery uh, and policy also plays its role in the reproduction of those inequalities. So there are different dimensions. So in a sense, Piketty, importantly, looks at one area. But I think that if you're going to take education seriously, um, you have to look at it uh, much more broadly. I think it would be very interesting for listeners to hear more about how education can contribute to inequality. Because I think on the surface, that doesn't sit well with a lot of people because they would see it as education is the way to achieve equality and, and to achieve progress. Yeah, no, that's, that, that, that's right. Well, I guess, you know, the simplest terms, uh, particularly if you have a Western, uh, if we're thinking about uh, a Western audience, um, is the way that education privileges some actors and undermines others. The inequality in the provision of education in, in my own country, in the UK, depending on your postcode, uh, the qualities of schools are often highly differential. Uh, the differentiation in your parents' salary may determine what type of school you go to, whether you go to a private school. So education in that sense acts as a filter for social class, whether you can afford a house in a, a nice area, uh, a wealthy area where there are good schools or you live in a poor area. Um, so those dimensions, I think, reproduce themselves around the world in the sense that education is often highly stratified. 
Um, but there are also other dimensions of the way education reproduces inequality in terms of, for example, language. The language issue is a big one. Uh, whose language gets taught in countries and whose languages get marginalised? And what is the effect of that on those that speak that marginalised language? How do they perform in schools? Do they perform less well? If so, what's the effect of that in the long term? And then uh, in terms of uh, even the content, the curriculum content of schooling, uh, let's think about uh, you are from a minority community in a particular country and you're learning about the heroes of that nation and none of your communities are ever represented there are always representations from other communities. How does that make you feel? What does it lead to? So there's a lot of ways that education can reproduce alienation. And of course, vice versa, a highly equitable, inclusive, open education system may be able to smooth over some of those inequalities that are inherited through generation. And is part of the inheriting through generations related to imperialism, as you said earlier? Yes. Certainly, if you're looking at... Um, let's take uh, the exploration of the African uh, curriculum. What we see is a legacy of colonial interventions into uh, the national education system. So take a country like Kenya that inherited its education system from uh, years of colonial rule, uh, where there was a highly elitist education system where for the vast majority were excluded and a minority were selected to play roles in the civil, in, in the civil service, uh, a small elite. Uh, that model of education still carries on to reproduce a highly unequal uh, class structure, often justified by education uh, attainment, but actually preordained through social class. I'd like to shift gears here to, to look at some of your work um, in educational development, um, particularly in, in countries like um, South Sudan or Myanmar, in some more of these conflict areas, as you said earlier. What have you found how inequalities kind of manifest and function um, inside education in, in some of these um, conflict areas or, or countries that have experienced conflict? Right. Um, well, uh, maybe I should take a step back. I think that development itself as a field is a highly contradictory uh, field. On the one hand, uh, international development has this idea within it of the rest catching up with the West. This idea that through um, the study of development, national ex-colonial states, post-colonial states will eventually catch up with the West. Um, but at the same time, international development for other thinkers is a mechanism through which the chains of colonialism were, the armies were replaced by new mechanisms, new chains, which were far less visible, not necessarily less powerful than the troops. And so I think that the field itself reproduces some of this uh, dilemma wherever it goes in a sense is the, the question of is international development doing good and uh, redressing some of these inequalities or actually is it there to reproduce them in different modes and different ways and I think that um, you see that all around uh, you know you see for example in Sierra Leone the role of the international peacekeeping community uh, that came during the war and after the war uh, in the 1990s 
massively increasing the cost of housing and accommodation in the central, rise, uh, forcing prices of food up as the international community intervenes in the conflict. And it's those kind of things, uh, you know, some would say the un unintentional effects of intervention, which often reproduce uh, or exacerbate inequalities. And the same you can go for looking at um, international intervention in education systems. Uh, are they improving the system? Are they reducing inequalities? Or are, are they actually exacerbating those? And, you know, depending where you're looking, uh, you have different answers. I mean, Kenya, I come back to Kenya just because I've done work in there recently and the British government DFID has been promoting um, low-cost uh, um, basic education uh, for poor communities um, uh, private uh, private schooling for uh, poor communities uh, which is it seems to be having a demonstrable negative effect on poor communities and that's being pushed by an international development agency uh, um, in the name of doing good, but actually seems to be having devastating effects. So I think that when I teach students of international development, which I do every year, uh, I always kind of ask them at the beginning of the class how they feel about entering the field of international development. And they always say, you know, we're really pleased, we want to, you know, help. In Africa, we want to help in Asia, and I say, well, I hope by the end of the course that you feel a little bit ashamed as well, and that uh, by the end of the course you actually think that some of the things that have been done in the name of development are actually just as bad as some of the things that have been done in the name of war. Is that how you feel? Oh, yes, uh, largely. Um, I mean, as I said, it's a contradictory field. If I thought that it was only doing bad, I wouldn't remain inside the field. But there is a strong sense that, like many other terrains, uh, there is a battle going on. It's a terrain of contestation. Um, and you fight your battles inside that field to push it in certain directions and dependent on different social forces at different times development moves in different directions so you know take the 1980s and the global policy of structural adjustment that was had an absolutely devastating effect on African and Latin American communities massively increasing inequalities. I mean, I don't think anybody can say that that was a positive period. But the reaction to that was a period of, uh, let's say, um, more social democratic approach, a range of different reforms, a range of different challenges to that model. Although I have to say that, um, you know, a lot of the remnants of that model still remain, particularly within some of the big institutions like the World Bank. In your article, you say that you you have to manage your existential angst when it comes to the contradictions of educational development. Do you have any tips for someone like myself who who does a little bit of work in international development as well and, and feels similar conflicting kind of emotions working in that space? Uh, yeah, uh, I think so. Um... I mean, I am uncomfortable, and you know, I'm I'm happy to say that, and I say it to everyone. Um, but on the other hand, what I say to myself is, well, in the field that I work, which is on the relationship between education and conflict and violent conflict, if I didn't engage uh, with organisations and in the field, then I wouldn't be able to make any commentary on it. So I kind of say that you have to, in a sense, get your hands dirty in order to um, have some legitimacy in the debates that you're entering into. Um, and so, in a sense, I wouldn't advocate for people not to engage, but they would engage cautiously. 
Um, the second area I think that's important um, is uh, to understand that institutions, I've been working for UNICEF I think for the last seven years more or less, uh, most of my research time, which is about half of my, um, my, my, my time, my work time for the last seven years has been involved with UNICEF and I think that what I've learned from that experience is that um, these institutions themselves are not homogenous. There are different actors, different processes going on. And in a sense, often what happens is you get picked up by certain actors. They kind of know what they're looking for and pick people that think that they can deliver that. So in a sense, you get caught up in political battles that are going on in institutions. Um, and you often get picked up and then dropped by these institutions. Um, but I think that you can learn a lot. Um, I think the good thing about yourself, myself, if we're academics and not consultants, we're not only as good as our last job. We have our own job to go back to. We can select. We can be a bit more selective about what um, we get involved in. And I think that, um, you know, the problem with full-time consultants is that actually they're always looking for their next job and so they're always trying to please uh, the people who are paying them and I think that leads sometimes to some complicity in the production of information and evidence. So I would say for people to engage, when they engage with in a sense real world research that uh, um, they enter into that domain cautiously um, and also recognize, you know, some of the constraints. So part of this work that you've done, kind of straddling both the researcher and the consultant practitioner in educational development, is that you've ended up with your team um, putting together a framework of trying to understand uh, inequality in education in in ways that are probably more robust and complex than those being put forward by by others. Um, can you talk a little bit about your framework and 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 the value that you think it has? Yeah, um, well, um, as, as you were saying, I've been leading or co-leading a, a research consortium between the University of Amsterdam and the University of Ulster, where we've been working in a range of different countries on the issue, on the relationship between education and peace building. So... Um, when we came in, we had a lot of uh, initial meetings around um, how would we conceptualise um, peace building and education and then how would we apply that in the field to start analysing different countries. Um, now, that project um, began on the back of an earlier one that I did with Professor Alan Smith um, between 2010 and 2012 and in that we looked at Lebanon, Nepal and Sierra Leone and explored the relationship between education and conflict and um, through that analysis we developed a critique of um, the international community's approach to peace building and the location of education therein um, which was essentially that uh, the broad approach of the international community to peace building was a kind of security first liberal peace approach. And I'll just explain those very quickly. Um, essentially, the argument was that you need to have security before anything else um, can move forward. So you need to retrain the military, retrain the police, sort the prison system out, and then the social development, education, health can come later. Um, and this is also tied with an argument that um, there is a kind of um, process of the reconstruction of a conflict-affected state that you need to have security, then democracy, then open the country to uh, uh, open the markets up, uh, allow the economy to develop, and then eventually the rest of the stuff will follow. And basically our critique of that was that it produced a kind of negative peace. Um, the violence stopped, but the reasons that underpinned the violence often remained 
and uh, the things that underpinned that violence was often inequalities. Uh, so I remember that we went to rural villages in Sierra Leone and asked questions around, um, you know, 10 years after the peace process, what has peace brought? And often the response was very little. So communities largely saw little benefit from peace in terms of their material lives, their access to education, their access to water, etc. And uh, what we argued was that that approach, while short-termly successful, in the long term was laying the seeds for uh, another conflict, that they hadn't addressed the reasons why the conflict broke out in the first place. And we see that reproduced in many parts of the world. So that, that's our starting point to say that we need a more social peace building model and that more health and education are important. Um, so from that, with the new research project that we've done over the last couple of years, we developed a kind of social justice plus recognition, uh, reconciliation approach, which we called the four R's. We took the first three R's from Nancy Fraser's work on social justice, um, redistribution, recognition, and representation, so uh, economic inequality, cultural inequality, and political inequality. And we also added the fourth R of reconciliation, which was basically that um, you needed to address the drivers of conflict, which were often economic inequality, political and cultural inequality. But after a period of war, you also need to bring communities together. You need to have process of reconciliation. And in a sense, those are often in contradiction. On the one hand, if you want to address those inequalities, you have to upset people. You have to redress, redistribute, reorganise. If you try to reconcile people, you need to deal with the legacies of conflict, which means often bringing them together. So those four different R's, those four different dimensions working together, provided us, in a sense, with a kind of roadmap to explore different countries' approaches to education. So it allowed us to look at different dimensions of the education system. How much money is spent on the education system? Where does it go? How is it distributed? Who gets what? Where? Why don't others get more? It also allows us to look at recognition, which cultures are reified, which languages, which histories which communities are marginalised. It, it allows us to ask about representation, political issues. Who gets to make decisions about issues in the education system that affect them? Who are marginalised and excluded from those decisions? And then finally, what is the education system doing in terms of reconciliation, in terms of bringing communities back together after war? Is the school an obstacle to that process of reconciliation or a facilitator for that? So we looked at those different dimensions uh, and then produced a range of country reports around that, looking at different aspects of that. And, you know, all kind of heuristic approaches have their limitations, but I think that um, it's had some important uh, policy effects. Uh, it has been taken up by a range of different national governments. Um, I'm thinking South Sudan and South Africa in particular. Uh, so, you know, I'm pretty pleased with that. One of your critiques about uh, Thomas Piketty earlier was that he focused on empiricism and, and in a sense he wasn't taking a critical realist approach about trying to realize that there are there's a social ontology uh, more than empiricism. So some things we can't see that, that are important or, or structures that exist that um, determine behavior and action that can't necessarily be seen. How does your framework include a critical realist perspective? Well, I mean, I think that that framework, the four R's, is only a beginning in a sense that all it is is kind of coat hangers to hang 
different dimensions of injustices and inequalities on. What matters then is how you theorise and understand uh, the underpinnings of those inequalities, yeah? How did they emerge? Uh, what are the drivers? And I think that's why um, in the sociology paper that, that you talk about um, on Piketty, I've tried to talk about the interaction between capitalism, imperialism and modernity and the complex and interweaved ways that these three phenomena intersect to reproduce those inequalities. Well, Mario Novelli, thank you so much for joining Fresh Ed. It was really wonderful to talk on so many different topics. Thank you very much for inviting me. Mario Novelli is a professor at the University of Sussex. His latest article on inequality in conflict-affected contexts can be found in the most recent issue of the British Journal of the Sociology of Education. Next week, I speak with Tom Popkovitz about the impracticality of practical research. Fresh Ed is brought to you by the Globalization and Education Special Interest Group of the Comparative and International Education Society. Fresh Ed contributors include Rolf Straubhar, Eric Lehman, Debren Edwards Jr., Chrissy Monahan, and Aaron Baxter. Original music for Fresh Ed was created by Digital Primate. Please note that opinions expressed on Fresh Ed are solely those of the host or the guest interviewed, not CIES or the Globalization and Education SIG, which take no institutional positions. Please be sure to visit us at freshedpodcast.com. Thanks for listening. I'm Will Brem, and I'll see you next week.